Welcome to the OCO webinar series. Today's webinar is presented in collaboration with the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto and is designed for family caregivers to learn about frailty. As older adults living with frailty rely considerably on their family caregivers, our speakers today have reached out to these caregivers and listened to their current challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic. I am Indira Fernando, and I will be moderating this webinar today. I am one of the program leads here at the Ontario Caregiver Organization. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today, Joan Hunter, Dr. Barbara Liu, Sarah Shirhani, and Sarah Dolson. Joan has been a caregiver to her husband, Bruce, since his first stroke in September, 2016. Since Bruce's last stroke in May 2017 that left him with aphasia and dysphagia, Joan has managed many of his medical issues and as such has begun taking online courses to prepare herself for the uncertain challenges ahead. Joan is the positive, proactive person who is the happiest when helping others. Dr. Barbara Liu is a professor of medicine and division director for geriatric medicine at the University of Toronto. She is also the executive director of the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto and leads a network of 23 hospitals in the delivery of specialized geriatric services. Sarah Shirhani is a PhD candidate at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto and a fellow with the Canadian Frailty Network under the supervision of Dr. Walter Wichis. Sarah is completing her thesis entitled, The Relationship Between Informal Caregiving and Formal Healthcare Costs. And finally, we welcome Sarah Dolson, who is an experienced RN and clinical nurse specialist in geriatrics. Sarah has past experience working in geriatric emergency management as a nurse, and has also recently acquired experience working as a knowledge translation specialist for the Regional Geriatric Program of Ontario, and Senior Friendly Caregiver Education Project. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, hello everyone. Thank you for taking the time to participate in today's session. We have a full agenda for you. Joan will share you, uh, will share with you her caregiving experiences and tells you how caregiving was affected by COVID-19. Then my colleague Barbara talks about frailty and what uh, contributes to it. She also introduces a simple and short tool for you to use to identify frailty. And after that, Sarah, uh, my other colleague, talks about mobility, nutrition, introduces some easy to use tools and provides you with some quick wins around communication with healthcare uh, professionals. Next slide, please. So when the pandemic started, we at RGP thought there is a space for developing educational resources for caregivers on uh, caring for frail older adults at home. The first step, of course, was to talk to caregivers and identify their needs. Um, the good news was that RGP has already co-developed uh, the Caregiving Strategies Handbook with more than 100 caregivers. This is the uh, handbook. We will share the link with you. Um, so co-developing that um, handbook with caregivers meant that I did not need to start from scratch and only focus on COVID-19. So I was able to have in-depth interviews with five caregivers to see how COVID-19 affected their responsibilities and what kind of information could help them in caring for their loved ones. I spoke to a male and four female family caregivers. They were all seniors caring for older adults, a spouse or parent for at least three and up to 12 years. So beside the challenges that many of us faced amid the pandemic, such as issues with grocery shopping, online or in person, and of course, quarantine here, the main theme that I, ident that I identified uh, um, around caregivers' challenges was uh, disruption in formal care uh, sorry, formal care services. For example, cancellation of daycare program, which robbed the care recipients from social activities that were perceived to be crucial for their well-being and mental health and robbed caregivers from some alone time. 
Um, additionally, caregivers express short-term and long-term uh, concerns. So the main uh, concern was to keep themselves and their care recipients COVID-19 free. What if something happens to the care recipient or what if something happens to me? Were repeated many times. So what if she or he has a fall? And my interviews were done in early stages of the pandemic. So the caregivers were really worried about taking their loved ones um, to uh, medical appointments or emergency rooms. Um, they also worried about being the only one keeping an eye on the patient or the care recipients. So for example, monitoring their blood pressure, temperature. They also worried about life after current restrictions are lifted. So they were thinking about um, do they want to send their loved one back to a daycare uh, uh, program? Do they want to send their loved ones to long-term care homes um, when the time comes? So these were caregiving or caregivers' challenges and concerns. And based on these findings and based on what caregivers told me about the information that they need, um, we developed this webinar and decided to focus on frailty, fall prevention, and nutrition during the pandemic. But that was not all. There is more. Yes, I heard about challenges, but what I also heard were stories of resiliency. Caregivers took pride in their caregiving role, and in uh, facing the challenges, they quickly developed new routines that worked best for both themselves and the care recipients. They were great problem solvers uh, and good at finding new ways, which I leave it to Joan to talk to you about. She will share some great examples with you. Joan, the virtual stage is yours. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Joan Hunter and uh, um, Sarah's already told you a bit about what my story is like. So um, I'm a caregiver, as she said, and um, I care for my husband, Bruce, who's had several strokes um, and besides the aphasia and dysphagia, it also affected his mobility. And so because of that, he's had many falls. He uses a walker, which he dislikes and prefers his cane instead. And I have to remind him that if he gets tired, he cannot sit on his cane. He also uses a, uh, has a super cubic catheter and he was recently diagnosed with Parkinson's so as you can see, we were dealing with many health issues and every day is a challenge for us, to say the least. So to help me cope with these challenges, I began taking online courses on aging, dysphagia, nutrition, and caring for people with chronic conditions, to name a few. I found these courses very helpful as they gave me a sense that I was not alone. I could blog with people all over the world facing some of the same challenges. However, Courses only give you the knowledge to perform the tasks and the daily tasks still have to be tackled so you get on with them. And some of my daily tasks are of course helping him with his medication, showering and getting dressed, putting in his hearing aids, changing and cleaning his catheter bags, monitoring his overall health issues and preventing falls by ensuring that he uses his walker. Trying to encourage and engage him in activities which is a huge challenge as he suffers from chronic fatigue. He wakes up tired and I have to constantly wake him up to eat his breakfast. I know one of the side effects of his Parkinson's medication is drowsiness. Um, so I started getting to take his medication, that medication after breakfast, but it sort of still didn't solve the problem. So I'm, I'm still working on that one. And feeding him with his dysphagia is really another big challenge because he should have all pureed foods, but he kind of um, um, resists them. So I compromise and I uh, cut them up very small so that he can manage it. And uh, for lunch, I make smoothies. And uh, also I prepare probably several vegetarian meals during the week, which I find helps a lot. <clears throat> And before COVID-19, my husband was in a day program, which gave him something to look forward to. And it was my sort of one free day a week from caregiving. We both really looked forward to Thursdays and you might say it became our favorite day of the week. And some of the things I do to sort of help me get through each day is I start each day with yoga and prayer. I think this keeps me grounded so that I'm better able to cope with 
what the day may throw at me. And caregiving, as you probably all know, takes a toll on your emotional health. So it is important that as caregivers, we look after our own health too. Exercise is the best thing you can do. It relieves stress and rewards your body in many other ways. I have quite a few hobbies. I read and sew, and I love listening to music, especially when I'm working in the kitchen. And it even makes me feel like dancing, which I love to do sometimes. <laughs> um, and so um, that was pre-COVID. Life after COVID was, was very difficult for us. Um, with the social distancing, we weren't able to see our son and his family. And we were going there almost every Sunday for dinner. So we really missed that. Grocery shopping became a challenge. Um, I started online shopping, and I think it was after my third order when I only got half of the items I ordered that I sort of decided that was enough of that. So I decided to join the other people in line. Um, another one of the things was COVID. Um, um, uh, our hair started to grow, of course, and my husband likes short hair. So I ended up cutting his hair twice and I've even cut my own once. So you have to be very, very innovative. I think you have to find solutions to problems like that. Um, also, he was in the process of doing his long-term care assessment and that was postponed or put on hold. Um, however, with long-term care, um, it's sort of a place that I don't want to go yet, but um, because I think I can still look after him and I will do that as long as I'm able to. Um, but it's something that I think you have to sort of have in place so that you're ready should that eventuality ever happen. And um, one of the things I would like to share with everyone is one of the things that COVID uh, sort of made me do. Um, as you know, seniors are we're at high risk for COVID-19. And with my husband's health issues, I just wanted to be prepared. We stayed in our apartment for the first three weeks um, of the lockdown and we never went out. And if we did, we wore masks and of course sanitized our hands frequently. But that still doesn't preclude you from getting COVID. Uh, so to err on the side of caution, I just wanted to be prepared. Um, and what got me started on it was I, I got an email from this organization that we we're members of reminding us that their new 2020 survivor workbook was ready so being a proactive person, I, I, I downloaded it. I started filling out the info, um, you know, information like where are your passports located? Where are your wills and all that type of thing so that when you go, your, your survivors have some somewhere to start. Anyway, before I knew it, I scrolled down to the bottom and um, it had um, a place where you could look after your funeral service. And so I thought, oh, why not? So I, before I knew it, we had our, I had our cremation all arranged and paid for. And my husband picked out an urn and I already had one. So I, I didn't choose one. And so, but uh, my um, urn wasn't really an urn. It was actually a vase, which sort of misshapen. And uh, I had to make a cover for it. So I had to get innovative and I, thought, well, how do I do that? So I've never worked with clay, but I, I made some some um, of the, the kind of clay that you make from flour and salt and water, mix it all together. And I started making prototypes for this cover. And then when I thought I had something that worked, I uh, ordered some air dry clay from uh, Amazon. And uh, I managed to fashion a top for my vase and to, uh, got something that worked and then I painted it and voila, I had a cover for my urn. So my survivor's handbook is all completed and I've got it saved on a USB and one day I'll hand it to my son and say, your son, we're good to go. <laughs> so I thought that would be a, a, a good ending to, to my story, one that I wanted to share with all of you. So, and uh, I wanna thank everyone for including me in this and uh, I hope I've contributed something <laughs> to your session and thank you very much to everyone. So thank you very much, Joan. That was wonderful and we really appreciate your sharing your personal story and that of your husband, Bruce. It fits very well with the rest of our discussion because we're gonna be focusing on caregivers, um, caregiving for people living with frailty. 
So not all seniors um, experience frailty, but some do. And so let's just spend a few minutes talking about what frailty is and how people can recognize it. Frailty is a vulnerability to stressors that may come, and those stressors may be associated with aging or with diseases that the person may be experiencing, or it can also be stressors from the broader determinants of health. And several of those things we're going to talk, Sarah Dolson is going to talk about a little bit later um, in the slide. As a result of that vulnerability, um, the person is um, at risk of having poor outcomes so that their functional independence may be reduced, they may have bad health outcomes, they may be in hospital uh, more frequently, need more care and support, or um, require admission to a long-term care earlier than other people might. So it's a condition that people are being, um, that are paying more attention to in the healthcare system and in terms of research. Um, for many years, it was discussed and it was somewhat of a vague concept, but it has really been embraced now as an important concept in geriatrics and aging um, health. So the way that we have been describing frailty um, has been through the use of various tools. And one of the most popular tools is called the Clinical Frailty Scale. And it's used widely around the world. And I'm proud to say that that was actually originated here in Canada by um, Dr. Kenneth Rockwood from Dalhousie University. And his group of researchers have continued to evolve that caregiving, or sorry, that frailty scale, and now have developed a pictorial fit frail scale, which is a screening tool for frailty that can be filled out by older people themselves and or their caregivers. And we're, it just takes about five minutes to complete, and it can be a, used as a tool to understand the person's own health state, but also to communicate with healthcare providers and other people involved in the circle of care. And that tool is available on the website that's there. And just so everyone knows, all the resources that we're going to be talking about during this webinar will be shared with you afterwards by email. So let's have a little bit of a look at the pictorial fit frail scale. It includes 14 different areas where you or the um, caregiver uh, or the older adult themselves would rate themselves on each of these domains. And these domains cover things like mood, cognitive performance, physical, functional performance, and some other things, for example, social connection. These are the list of the 14 domains. And I'll just give you a moment to look at those and reflect on how those things affect you or the person that you're caregiving for. Let's have a look at what the scale looks like when you go to fill it out. So it uses pictures um, for you to rate yourself or the person that you're providing care for in each of those domains. So for mood, you can see the picture from happy to very sad. For the number of medications ranging from none to several medications and everything in between. Here are some more of these pictures on the scale for mobility. So here's somebody who can do stairs independently, walk on a flat surface independently, can walk independently but needs an assistive device like a cane or a walker, needs the assistance of a person to help them, needs a wheelchair, is not able to leave the bed. And so, similarly, for each of those domains, those 14 domains that I showed you on the previous slide, there are similar pictures that help guide you in rating your own or the person's uh, functional abilities on the pictorial fit frail scale. So the, that scale, as well as other resources for caregiving, are available on the website for the RGPs of Ontario, the Regional Geriatric Programs of Ontario. And as I mentioned, we'll be sending those out to you afterwards. I'm going to pass things along to Sarah Dolson. Great. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for that segue, Dr. Liu. I'm just going to stop my video because I get kind of distracted by my video when I'm trying to talk to you wonderful people, but I'll come back. So uh, that's right, I've been, uh, I've been tasked with talking about uh, false prevention, nutrition, and self-care. Like Sarah said, 
um, in the beginning. Uh, this content is coming from caregiving strategies work. Um, uh, it was a project that um, I was happy to be a part of with the RGPO, the Regional Geriatric Program of Ontario for the last couple of years. So we'll be able to give you all of that access to all of the chapters. So some of this content is coming from that work. So we'll go next slide, Barbara. So I think we should begin uh, talking about fall prevention by first reviewing just really basic, simple terminology. Um, mobility uh, is defined as the ability to move your body. Mobilization is defined as the act of moving your body to the best of your ability. And the fall is defined as a descent from a high position to low position that a person just doesn't have any control of. Uh, and did you know um, immobility or not moving can quickly increase a person's dependence on others for help. It can lead to disability and ultimately increase the risk of falling, of course. In just a few days, lying in bed all day can lead to a very quick muscle loss, increased weakness, and again, it can make a person become less independent. Uh, and why we're mentioning this today is because it's very important when we consider how COVID 19 has most of us feeling a little stuck in our homes, less able to be as active as we once were prior to this pandemic. We'll go next slide, please. So just digging a little deeper into how we can do our best to prevent falls, let's first consider some of the common uh, causes of falls in older adults. So we've got two of the most common uh, presented on this slide. So we have slips and trips and medication side effects. Examples of slips and trips are pretty straightforward. Um, they are tripping over soft rugs, for example, on the floor or loose rugs or a wet tile floor. Medication side effects, for example, could be uh, when a medication makes a person feel a little bit sleepy or drowsy or dizzy oh. or off balance. Yeah. Um, many slips and trips may also result from um, chronic health issues or a person's health condition. So chronic conditions like diabetes or respiratory issues of any kind and things like chronic pain can increase the risk of a person falling. We'll go next slide. So it's really important to know and understand the risks because now we can actually dig down and talk about strategies to mitigate those risks and even prevent a fall. Uh, and the best way to do that and Joan mentioned it uh, and articulated it very well in her story. It's just to stay as physically active as your abilities allow. Why? Because we've heard time and time again, and it has been proven over and over, that even the smallest amounts of activity during the day is known to help improve skin health, appetite and digestion, strength, how you manage pain, the quality of your sleep, how your body heals and prevents infection, and certainly how your heart and lungs function. Go ahead, uh, thanks. So uh, what did I say? I said, as much as your abilities allow. So what does that mean, Sarah? Well, how do we know how to be as active as our abilities allow? The RGP of Toronto has actually broken that down and made that very simple to, um, in just in three levels. So if you think of the first level where a person cannot stand up to transfer at all, um, this person is reliant on a caregiver to use some sort of a lift to get up. That would be one level of mobility. A second level of a mobility would be where a person can absolutely stand up and transfer from a bed to chair with or without support, but they don't walk short distances. And then the third level of mobility would be where a person can walk uh, short distances at a minimum with or without a walking aid. So when you break it down into those three levels, it doesn't matter where you fall or where the person um, that you care for falls into these levels uh, because there are strategies and ways to still act uh, to add activity into your daily routines. And actually, we'll go ahead to the next slide so I can show you this tool um, which makes it a little bit easier to pick and choose strategies to do that. So it's really cool. A uh, really awesome tool developed again by the RGP of Toronto, a very creative team. It's called the stretch lift or tap, uh, which uh, we call the slot tool. It's a real world resource. It's a tool we're now giving to you. 
Um, it's really useful right now uh, for individuals who are unable to leave their living spaces during the pandemic, but certainly this is meant to be a tool that exists well beyond the pandemic. It includes suggestions for how to add more movement into everyday activities, and it includes a couple of different mobility games. And we will definitely be sure that each audience uh, member gets an, a link to this tool. Uh, one thing I wanted to say about this is when, you know, activity is usually suggested, one of the biggest myths or fears out there is that we got to, you know, get into personal training and do um, jumping jacks and really exert ourselves and equipment needs to be purchased. But I, I'd like to, to beg to differ. This isn't the case, and I think we have everything at our, exposal, our, our disposal to use around us um, just to stay moving based on the level of mobility that we can manage. So I didn't put uh, an exhaustive list of what the tool offers on this slide, uh, but just an example of adding stretching, for, uh, for example, into your day would be to put toiletries further away and reach out for them. The same could be said if you're, you're putting groceries away. A way to add lifting motions into your day would be to do arm curls with a shampoo bottle while bathing, or again, with, with a vegetable or a can of soup while putting groceries away or cooking. And uh, while um, an, an example of adding tapping motion into your day would be to tap your toes on a bath mat uh, to dry the soles of your feet after a bath. So even more fun to note here, I wanna get your attention on uh, one thing. It, it, this, like I said, the tool is free, completely accessible um, for anybody to use. But if you'd like to take it a step further, the RGP of Toronto is really interested in your feedback uh, because ultimately these tools need to be the best that they can be for the people who are going to be using them. So your feedback, your input, your opinions on the use of these tools is gonna to be very, very valuable. Um, and if you're interested in participating, you would email info at rgptoronto.ca. And I know I'm going quickly here, but uh, we'll make sure that you have access to that email and some instructions in a summary that's going to be sent to participants after this webinar. But uh, anybody who participates in a sort of a before after uh, survey, just really brief survey, is going to be entered in a draw to win a prize. So just saying, you could gamble. Uh, and uh, try your luck at a prize, uh, but certainly use the tool to your liking. So let's go ahead uh, right to the next slide, please. Right, so there, um, there definitely are lots of different tips, and what we tried to do today is break those down into either quick wins, so uh, strategies that are easily implementable, pretty cheap, they don't cost very much, you don't need many people to do them, uh, but then there's other strategies that we offer to you that you might need a bit more support, either from somebody or equipment um, and that sort of thing. So examples of quick wins here would be, like I said, trying the slot tool, trying different tools to add um, mobility to uh, everybody's daily routine. Clearing paths for walking, removing loose rugs, tucking cords out of the way. A uh, really interesting one, if you don't do this already, but assisting a person to get dressed while they sit in a chair has been known in the literature to reduce falls by, uh, I think, well over 50%. And then certainly uh, proper fitting shoes and non-slip footwear are really often suggested for falls prevention. But where you might need a little bit more support is, say, when we suggest you should have equipment in the bathroom, so grab bars, shower seats, that's where you might want to talk to an occupational therapist if, um, if you haven't got that equipment in your, in your house um, or your residence yet. Uh, suggestions like using handrails on both sides of the stairs. Um, I mean, it's not currently code in any of the ways that the buildings are built, but having two handrails certainly uh, prevents risk of uh, falling uh, on the stairs, but it might mean you need a little bit of help to install unless you're really handy. Uh, and then also, as Joan mentioned, also in her story, so talking with a pharmacist or prescriber to recognize what medications may, may sort of make a person feel tired, what puts them at an increased risk of fall. So being proactive about knowing what medications might uh, be a little bit tricky after lunch, for example.
and then using safe uh, transfer techniques for sure. Um, you might want to talk to a physiotherapist about that or, or learn by watching a video. So one last slide here about uh, falls prevention before we move into our next segment is really about communicating with healthcare providers in a way that gives your clear and detailed description of what you're seeing on a daily basis because what your observations are as a caregiver are invaluable to helping a healthcare professional go down a path of, of investigation. So number one, you're gonna offer as much detail as you need. Um, when did the fall occur? Uh, how many have there been? Where in the house or in the community are these falls happening? What happened just before? What happened after? What sort of things have you tried? Um, any details about falls that have happened previous to this? Uh, and even what we call close calls, those are really tricky. Um, you might observe uh, the person that you're caring for almost fall, but you know, if that chair wasn't there, they would have fallen, or if that wall wasn't there to catch them. So all those unexplained losses of balance are really good key pieces um, of information to share. Secondly, uh, and I'm gonna keep repeating this uh, in the next segment as well, feel comfortable to ask as many questions as you need to be confident that your questions are answered. And really tell them how you prefer to connect. You know, right now, especially virtually, that could be an option that you prefer. Email, telephone, face-to-face. -face. Um, but examples of, of questions that you could ask around mobility is, so is, is there a reason for a, a change in Bob's mobility, the way he's walking? Is there um, a medication that he's taking right now that can cause a bit of uh, dizziness or loss of balance? What support does uh, the local community have to offer Bob and I to join a falls prevention course or program or exercise program, that sort of thing. And again, lots of additional resources here that we're gonna send you so that you can dive into the caregiving strategies content. And there's also a sit to stand transfer video for, for those of you who are interested. So let's move into nutrition. Thanks, uh, Dr. Liu. So again, we're gonna start with terms um, that require a little bit of a brief, uh, but pretty straightforward review. So good nutrition is the act of eating a variety of foods that are necessary for health and growth. Poor nutrition, which I use simultaneously with malnutrition, is where there's a lack of intake of food or nutrients leading to poor health. And dehydration is a condition that occurs when the body just does not have enough water to function properly. And we don't go, into dehydration in today's webinar, but certainly in the caregiving strategies work that we're gonna send you, there's much more detail um, found in that nutrition chapter about dehydration. So there are so many benefits of maintaining good nutrition. I probably don't have to preach this to anybody on the call right now. It's known to improve quality of sleep, things like blood sugar, digestion, uh, blood pressure and how the heart functions ability for the body to fight infection and heal from illness and just how effective uh, medications can be and how medications are metabolized. So we'll go to the next slide. Right, so we want to start by leaving you with another tool for this segment. Um, and this is going to, this tool is going to help you as a caregiver uh, identify nutrition risk. Um, so it's called the self mini nutritional assessment. It's a questionnaire that you don't need any sort of clinical training for. It's uh, specifically meant to screen for malnutrition by caregivers or uh, older adults. And we'll definitely be sharing this link with you. Um, it doesn't come in a PDF. You sort of have to access it online. So what I'll tell you is that you just scroll halfway down the page and there's a big, big title that says for self-completion by older adults or caregivers. And, and then there's a multiple languages that you can um, complete this tool which, to whichever language uh, you prefer. And uh, yeah, so the next slide here is showing you the first page. I think the, the, the tool is just about two pages only. But what you would do is the tool is, if you can see, sorry about the, um, the size of the font here, but what the tool looks into uh, is food intake, weight loss in the past three months, uh, mobility, any stressors or illnesses that the person has experienced in the last three months, and then certainly the presence of dementia or depression, which has an effect on nutrition. And what you do is you score a zero, a one or a two, or even a three in one case, uh, and you tally up your score uh, after you make your way through the whole tool. And um, 
and you'll get a score that reflects either normal nutritional status, so the higher the score, the better. A risk of malnutrition would be a score between 8 and 11, and then where scores are falling anywhere from 0 to 7, you, that person would be deemed malnourished. And like I said, it's a really good tool for self-awareness, but certainly uh, with those lower scores, it would be used as a, a fantastic communication device. Um, right, thank you. So there are lots of other strategies to manage good nutrition and certainly do what works for you and what's unique to you. Uh, but here's a couple other uh, strategies just to inspire. So planning ahead of time, certainly always gonna help with that decision fatigue at the end of the day. Uh, booking grocery shopping in your calendar so you have slotted time to get out. Uh, writing meal ideas down so you can refer back to later. Again, looking at that decision fatigue and that feeling of overwhelm sometimes, try to mitigate that. Including fluids for sure. So there's certain foods that are act as fluids. So yogurt and soups, for example. And there are definitely ways to get inspired. So reviewing recipes online or asking for recipes from family and friends. And definitely get connected and ask for help if you need it. Um, that's what we heard time and time again from caregivers. Uh, consider Meals on Wheels or other frozen food delivery services if that's what works for you. But certainly what other community programs are out there? Dining programs, dining clubs, that sort of thing. And then obviously don't forget to enjoy by preparing the meals that you do enjoy together. I mean, that's incredibly important to manage good nutrition. So um, again, ending this uh, nutrition segment around communication, just identical to the falls. It's really about communicating your story as clearly as possible, what your observations are, take that healthcare professional down a, a journey to really visualize and understand what's going on. So offering detail like how much weight has this person lost and in how long, um, when did this, do you think it started, you would share uh, how long they may have had difficulty with chewing or swallowing, for example, and how much difficulty they might have, um, what you've tried so far, and then definitely share that self m &A tool with, with the uh, healthcare professional. And again, asking questions. So examples of these questions could be, uh, what might be causing these changes in weight? Are there certain medications that he, Bob is taking that causes this weight loss? Um, is, there, is there something going on uh, with his health that's causing this weight loss? And what support does the community have to offer me and Bob for nutrition? Like I said before, are there dining programs? Are there dietitian services? What about a nutritionist in the area? That it, do any of these require referrals and can I get one? One more resource here, what we learned from caregivers uh, over the past couple months is that uh, COVID-19 has created a number of challenges on how we get our groceries. So 211, if you don't know about it already, 211 Ontario can connect you with services that help get groceries anywhere from a low cost uh, with delivery available, um, if you don't have a credit card, those types of things that make it kind of challenging right now. Uh, 211 Ontario by phone, so by dialing 211 from your landline or cellular telephone day or night. Um, so we'll be sure this link is also included in the, uh, in the summary for you all as well. And again, some nice additional resources for you to delve in at your leisure, um, anywhere from the caregiving strategies chapter and content, the tool to assess for malnutrition, a sample weekly meal plan from Eat Right Ontario, a great resource, reputable resource, and a little bit of information about oral health as well, which obviously affects um, nutrition. So finally, I mean, unfortunately, we're talking about this topic last, um, but certainly top of mind. Uh, Joan was also mentioning self-care in her story. So when Sarah was doing her, correct me if I'm wrong, Sarah, but uh, when Sarah was doing her interviews with caregivers, they definitely acknowledge the importance of caring for themselves to be able to uh, find that resilience and continue, uh, which is, yeah, incredibly difficult to do sometimes. Um, but when Sarah was asking them sort of to rank what type of information they wanted on today's webinar, they actually ranked um, the discussion around self-care last. But that speaks to 
who you are as people, your selflessness. Um, you should be commended for the work that you do all across Ontario. So thank you for that. Um, just a reminder to recharge, do you, utilizing those activities that make you feel like your battery's being recharged. And, um, and if, uh, Barbara, if you switch to the next slide, we're gonna leave you with a number of different resources that you can tap into. So the Ontario Caregiver Organization uh, has quizzes to recognize the level of stress. There's also ways that you can identify to prioritize areas where you might need a bit of support there. The Caregiving Strategies chapter um, has a lot of different resources uh, in there too. And but we understand that to pack it all in is is challenging for the part for the audience um it's it's a bit overload so certainly take that at your own time and and look into what you're interested in but feel free to browse through these resources that we're going to provide for you so so before i just push this back over to um indira i just want to thank on behalf of all of the par uh, panelists um I'm sure they would say the exact same to thank you as participants for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. We're very happy to help. Uh, we're very happy to create this, this um, ability to connect with each other today. A really special thank you for um, Joan, to Joan for sharing her story. It takes a lot of courage uh, and it makes you feel a little bit vulnerable when you're sharing personal uh, stories about yourself. Um, and uh, really amazing, Joan, the, the, uh, the chat was absolutely filled up with um, praise for you after your story. Uh, again, so just uh, for more detail about the Regional Geriatric Program of Toronto, I encourage you to visit their website. They have a lot of education. Uh, they have um, fantastic uh, resources um, and uh, the, the the one thing that I want to draw your attention to again is that slot tool. Feel free to use it. It is free. If you want to take it the step further, contact info at rgptoronto.ca and you'll be entered into a draw for a prize just for a brief uh, before and after survey. Your, va your feedback is incredibly valuable. Uh, and like we keep repeating ourselves, we're going to share a summary of today's discussion with you after the webinar. We're going to provide access to all of the resources. And uh, I think I'm gonna push this back over to Ontario Caregiver Organization to facilitate uh, any question and answers. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.